the Victoria Tunnel, Newcastle. There's two stories really to tell you about the Victoria Tunnel. We'll begin by looking back to the 1830s and 40s and I'll tell you a little bit about why they decided to construct a tunnel, how it was constructed and how it was operated. And then we'll jump forward to the time of the Second World War, when the tunnel saw another lease of life, when it was used as an air raid shelter. So if you'd like to take your hard hat and put it on, and also your torch and follow me, we'll go along into the Victoria Tunnel. And here we are. You can see now why you'll need your torch, except at the entrance, there's no modern electric light. You'll need your torch. Oh, and by the way, please don't eat or drink anything in the tunnel. There are no creepy crawlies, bats or mice or anything like that, for the simple reason there's nothing in there for them to eat. And be a little bit careful in one or two places where the floor is wet and slippery. And you can see on the left hand side of the tunnel, there's a gully of running water. Don't put your ankle in there and twist it, please. And here's a map of the tunnel route in orange. We start in the top left, the area around Spittle Tongues, and we'll see the old colliery in a moment or two. The tunnel then follows the line of Claremont Road down to Barris Bridge, and then onwards through Shieldfield, coming out on two staiths or piers, again long since disappeared, on the River Tyne itself, just about where the Ooseburn flows into the Tyne. The tunnel is two and a quarter miles long, but don't try to walk through it any longer. That's impossible. Um, I normally think of the tunnel in three sections. The section that concerns us most, because it's the only section we can visit with members of the public, is the section from the River Tyne going up about 700 metres towards where New Bridge Street meets Biker Bridge. And at that point, unless you bring a heavy pneumatic drill with you anyway, you've got to turn back and walk back on the same route. So the middle section leading from about Biker Bridge up to near the Civic Centre or Barris Bridge area, that now that area is part of the storm drainage and sewerage system of Newcastle and we have no access to that section at all. However, from very close to what I still call the Hancock Museum or the Great North Museum now, there is another entrance into the tunnel. You might have seen it at the bottom of Claremont Road. And it is possible to go in there and to walk a considerable distance up towards Spittle Tongues. You would need, however, Wellingtons and old clothes. You can see roots of trees growing through the roof of the tunnel. And there isn't an emergency exit, so we're not allowed to take people into that section. So it's really the bottom right hand corner of the section that concerns us. And please don't go looking for these old houses or these people long since departed in long row. You wouldn't be very far here from the modern headquarters of the BBC Newcastle. In other words, we're very close to the site of the colliery Spittletongues itself. And here we are, a sketch of the colliery. And I want you in your imaginations now to go back to 1835, when two enterprising, if not very careful, businessmen, a Mr. Porter and a Mr. Latimer, decided to open a pit at Spittletongues, 
to dig down for coal. They ought to have done their research a little bit more carefully. They would have discovered that the quality of the coal in this particular part of the coal field was poor. The coal was all right for domestic purposes, but not for industrial or steam raising purposes. And secondly, the seams of coal in this particular part of the coal field were very badly broken up or fragmented. And this, of course, would push up the cost of exploitation. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> they went ahead and they sank a shaft and they brought coal to the surface. And then they had another problem. How do you transport your coal from the pit head to the nearest navigable river from where most of the coal would be exported to the London markets? If you think back to the little map we saw before, the obvious thing to do would be to lay a railway line due south from the pit to the river on the western side of Newcastle, Scotchwood area, for example, where in a theory, I suppose, you could load your ships and sail the coal away. But you couldn't in actual fact, for the simple reason that where the swing bridge is now was the site of the old Tyne Bridge, a very low bridge and only small boats could sail underneath it. <clears throat> so if you had loaded your coal on the western side of Newcastle, you'd have then had to transship the coal from one side of the Tyne Bridge to the other. And I don't think our friends Porter and Latimer actually consider that really as a serious proposition at all. And what they were forced to do in those early years, 1836, 37 and so on, was to transport their coal by cart and horse down through the streets of Newcastle. And you don't need me to point out that that was slow and dirty and noisy, very uneconomical indeed. I don't think any of the residents living nearby would be at all happy with carts and horses trundling down past their windows day and night. <clears throat> they had another idea. Why can't we lay a railway line due eastwards over the town moor to Wall's End? and unload the coal into ships at Wall's End. Sorry, you can't do it. The freemen of Newcastle jealously and quite rightly guard carefully the town moor. You can't build anything on the town moor. And things must have been getting pretty desperate by about 1838, <clears throat> when a very important man enters the scene. I suppose we'd call him a civil engineer today. Well, William Gillespie turns up. He may in fact have been an employee of Porter and Latimer at the colliery. We don't really know. And William Gillespie, clever, ingenious engineer, said to Porter and Latimer, gentlemen, I think I can solve your problem. Why don't I build you a tunnel? And I'm fairly sure that at first, Porter and Latimer thought, thought this was a very silly idea. Tunnels are difficult and slow, complex, expensive to build. But William Gillespie, he made a proper study of the geology of the area. And he realized that he would be cutting his tunnel, not through solid rock, but through boulder clay. Why? The tunnel follows the line of an old river valley. And at the end of the ice age, when the ice sheet had retreated, it had laid down deposits of boulder clay, which had gradually filled the valley. And he could use the valley filled with boulder clay to cut his tunnel in. And fairly obviously, or we wouldn't be listening to this, fairly obviously, Porter and Latimer were persuaded, money was found, and Gillespie, with 200 navvies who would do the hard, backbreaking work, he didn't use explosives, just muscle power, and spades and shovels. And in the remarkably short time of two years and 10 months, the tunnel was cut and completed and opened in 1842. Uh, transport costs dropped immediately by about 85%. Everybody was very happy. They had a poem commissioned. The tunnel's two miles and it's strange for to tell 
The twenty full wagons will travel on it well, with men for to break them they travel doon so clever that in less than six minutes they're doon to the river. Well, I don't know if it only took six minutes, but they must have been going these wagons at a good speed because when everything was working efficiently and at uh, maximum power, they could shift three loads every hour. Now, when I say three loads, I mean eight, 10, 12 coal wagons coupled together, each wagon containing about two and a half tons of coal. They could shift those down and then they had to pull the empty wagons back up. So that actually would make six journeys in an hour. They were beginning to shift a lot of coal and they were much relieved, no doubt rather happy for a short time. Now, if you'd spent the last two years, 10 months, lying on your back, kicking, hacking away at clay, like those poor navvies did, you would want some sort of celebration. And the celebration was arranged for the navvies in the big market, where actually Holland and Barrett is now. It used to be the Unicorn Inn, and the 200 navvies were treated to meat pies, strong ale, and music no doubt enjoyed themselves late into the night. The <clears throat> dignitaries, the councillors, the bankers who put up the money for the tunnel, Porter and Latimer, they're good ladies, they would also want perhaps a more sophisticated celebration and it was laid on for them. A large white marquee is erected down by the River Tyne where the tunnel came out to the river and fine wine and fine food was no doubt provided. And as an extra special treat, our party were invited to assemble, oh no, not at the river, but at Spittle Tongues Colliery, where they see lined up, I think it was eight wagons ready to go. In the first four wagons, coal has already been uh, loaded. And into the next two or three wagons, our party in their elegant evening attire, white dresses for the ladies, top hats for the gentlemen, dinner jackets. The party is invited to clamber over the side of these coal wagons, which perhaps had seating arranged in them for the party, but there was no suspension or springs in the wagons. And in the last wagon, there was a brass band to play them through the tunnel. And they were pushed off with all the coal dust billowing back over those lovely white dresses. And they were pushed off relatively slowly, it seems, because it took them about 30 minutes to make their way down through the black tunnel out onto the quayside to the sound of a cannon. And then they proceeded to enjoy themselves into the early hours of the morning. But after all, this hard work and money and effort. One of the sad things to tell you about the tunnel is that only after 18 short years, the tunnel and the mine closed their doors forever. The tunnel had gone bankrupt, the, sorry, the mine had gone bankrupt on several occasions, in fact, and closed its doors for the final time in 1860 and lay more or less abandoned and forgotten until, as we'll see shortly, the Second World War. Here we are then, inside the tunnel, <clears throat> quite near the entrance, I think, because I can see the modern lighting on the left-hand side of the tunnel wall there. The construction of the tunnel. Well, we already know it was dug through boulder clay. And I think we can be absolutely certain that they didn't simply start, say, at the tine end and dig and dig and dig and eventually come out at the colliery. That would have been far too slow. And if you think about it, only a few men could have worked at the face at the same time. Almost certainly, they traced out on the surface a line with pegs and string, the line they wished to follow. River Tyne, Shieldfield, Barris Bridge, Claremont Road, Spittle Tongues. 
And then at about intervals of four to 500 meters, they sank shafts to the requisite depths. Using a bit of clever mathematics, I imagine, because each shaft would have to be to a different depth to preserve a slope on the tunnel for wagons to roll down. <clears throat> Men would then be lowered down the shafts, two teams perhaps, one cutting up and one cutting down to meet the next gang of labourers about 500 metres up the tunnel. And the sections would be linked together. <clears throat> you can see quite clearly from the photograph that the tunnel is made at least partly of brick. It's not one, but at least two metres thick, that brick. It's a very, very solid construction indeed. And except where the tunnel has been messed around with uh, repairs and alterations, it's as dry and as solid as the day it was constructed more than 170 years ago. So brick for the top portion, but if you look carefully at the lower portion of the walls, you can see that it's not brick, but seems to be rough blocks of actually sandstone. And Gillespie, clever Mr. Gillespie, was well aware of the advantages of recycling materials. Bricks come from clay. The clay came, of course, from the excavations of the tunnel. Clay was taken out up the shafts, fired in local brickworks, some of which were mobile, and then brought down and fixed uh, to the sides of the wall and the roof, recycling. The lower part also is recycling. Where does this sandstone come from? Well, in the 1840s, Granger Town was also being planned and constructed by Richard Granger. Those beautiful streets of the centre of Newcastle, Granger Street, Grey Street, uh, Collingwood Street, etc. There would be a fair amount of um, damaged stone, inferior quality stone, that was no use to, Gilles to, sorry, to Granger. And Gillespie got hold of this. I don't know whether he had to buy it or, or whether Granger was happy just to get rid of it. But anyway, Gillespie carted it down and used the stone for the lower part of the wall of the tunnel for most of the way through it. Now, in the construction of the tunnel, those 200 navvies or so working in gangs, I can offer you a couple of jobs. Would you like to be a kicker? <clears throat> Kicker sounds like a good job to me. You don't have to stand. You actually lie on a plank of wood at about a 45 degree angle to the floor. And using your legs and your feet and the blade of a shovel, you kick away all day long at the clay face of the, uh, of the tunnel ball that you're making. <clears throat> don't fancy being a kicker? I can offer you another job, this time as a rammer. The rammer lies on his back again, but um, horizontal, at about shoulder height. And the rammer's job is to ram clay above the uh, brick arch, brick roof that you see, between the brick roof and the original clay cut. He rams clay in, into any cavities or gaps, which otherwise would fill with water and damage the, the strength, reduce the strength of the tunnel. So, a kicker or a rammer, a nice easy job, perhaps lacking a little bit in uh, variety, but nevertheless, it's a job. It's not as obvious as it would have been before the Second World War, but the tunnel is actually built in the shape of an egg. The floor, you can see, was put in at the beginning of the Second World War. Before then, the floor was about 18 inches low, and it would have been more obvious that the tunnel is built in the shape of an egg. An egg being a very strong structure in nature. The more pressure weighing down, the tighter the bricks and the stone will be welded together. So we now know two things about the Victoria Tunnel. 
we know why it was deemed necessary to build a tunnel, and we know a little bit about the construction of it. Finally, what about the operation of the tunnel? Well, here's a more detailed map of Spittletongue's colliery, and if you look carefully at the bottom left, you can see the colliery and also the point at which the tunnel begins, where the lines disappear into the tunnel. Well, Gillespie designed uh, normal enough coal wagons, similar to the ones you might see at Beamish Museum. He designed coal wagons to fit quite tightly into the tunnel so he could get as much coal into each wagon as possible. And his coal wagons ran on normally enough railway lines. I say normally enough because the uh, railway lines were made out of timber with simply an iron plating on the top, presumably to keep the costs down. Now I used to think, well, uh, wood would wear out, timber would wear out very quickly. But then I remember that inside the tunnel, well, there's not really any weather. It never rains, the sun never shines, there's no frost. In fact, the temperature is almost exactly 12 degrees summer and winter. So I suppose that the timber rails would last a relatively long time. The gauge was the standard four foot, eight and a half inch gauge. So normal enough coal wagons, usually 10 or 12 linked together in a, in a wagon train, or normal enough railway lines. To move the heavy wagons from colliery to river, Gillespie used something that is free and readily available called gravity. Spittletongue's colliery is 222 feet higher than the River Tyne, where the tunnel came out. And there's a slope of about one or a gradient of about one in 90. So the wagons would roll down quite easily. And in fact, they would need to be bricked or they would run away. More about that in a moment or two. To move the relatively light empty wagons back up, after they had been unloaded into ships on one of two staves at the mouth of the tunnel at the river. To move the empty wagons back up, well, probably ponies initially, but it wasn't very long before a stationary 40 horsepower steam engine had been installed at Spittletongues with a revolving drum on its shaft, and Gillespie bought two and a quarter miles of hemp rope, he attached one end to the wagons and one end to the revolving drum. Pull the lever, chug, chug, chug. The engine starts, the drum revolves and pulls the empty wagons back up for the next load. Just one problem, they didn't have mobile phones or CCTV. So how did they know at the colliery when it was time to pull the empty wagons back up? Well, as you walk up through the tunnel on the left hand side, you see gaps in the brickwork. And we think that into these gaps were hammered blocks of wood and then special screws with an eyelet at the end of the screws were screwed into the blocks of wood all the way up from river to colliery. And through the eyelets of the screws was threaded a very uh, strong wire uh, a strong wire, a bit like a piano wire. This was then pulled tight and fixed down, a bell being attached at the colliery end. Hit the wire or wrap on it, the vibration will travel through the taut tight wire and cause the bell to ring. This we think would be the way they communicated when they were ready for the empty wagons to be pulled back up. And as I said before, when all was working well, they could shift two to three loads every hour. Well, Gillespie was a very successful engineer and was no doubt complimented at the clever way in which he solved all these problems. And one of the problems is that if you are being flattered and complimented, perhaps he got a bit complacent. 
and didn't really keep his eye on the health and the safety aspects of the operation. Coldest is very abrasive, and little by little it ate away, gnawed away at the hemp rope, and of course, in consequence, in 1843, the rope snapped, the wagon shot away out of control, out of the exit of the tunnel, into the River Tyne, from where the wagons and much of the cargo were recovered, put back on the rails. Gillespie, foolishly in my opinion, simply spliced the hemp rope together, and guess what happened shortly after? That's right, the rope split again. One wagon got away from the others, shot out over the end of the wharf or jetty onto a ship waiting to receive its coal. Well, it certainly received its coal in the coal wagon, which landed on the deck of the ship, went through the hole, glug, 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 and sank the ship. The insurance claims, I think, must have been considerable. But there can't be many examples of a coal wagon managing to sink a ship. But apparently it happened in, I think, 1845. The stationary engine used to haul the empty wagons back up also exploded on two occasions because it's not a bad idea to keep a boiler topped up with water. And the supervisors had forgotten to check that. And as we are taking people through the tunnel on their visit, occasionally a visitor will say they feel a little bit uneasy in the tunnel, not because of the darkness, we do have torches obviously, but they feel that there's some sort of mysterious presence watching, observing the group of visitors walking by. Now I say, well, I think I've got an explanation of that. I'll tell you what we think happened. It's this. In 1852, now that's only 10 years after the tunnel had begun operations. In 1852, the mine, the enterprise, had gone bankrupt, not apparently for the first time. Anyway, in 1852, the mine had gone bankrupt, so obviously no coal was being mined and there were no wagons coming through the tunnel. However, there was a considerable amount of interest amongst other coal owners in buying not the mine. We know already the quality of the coal was poor, but they were interested in buying the Victoria Tunnel. It's a bit like an oil pipeline. Other collieries could, of course, have used it to solve their transport problems. Quite a bit of interest was shown. But obviously, before you buy a second-hand colliery and tunnel, you would want it inspected. And that was the job of colliery viewers, or surveyors, I suppose. And we actually know the names of the two men employed to inspect and carry out an inventory of the empty Victoria Tunnel in 1852. They were two brothers, Ralph and Benjamin Arkless, who came from near Stanley, an area called Tanfield. Now, they couldn't just walk into the tunnel to carry out their inspection, even though the tunnel was empty. They needed the authority of the staithes man, the man responsible for the operation of the staithes at the River Tyne exit. And he was called Mr. William Coulson. Into his 60s now, a rather portly, perhaps rather unfit gentleman. So the three of them arranged to walk into the tunnel, carry out their inspection. I think it was on a Wednesday afternoon. Mr. Coulson had checked with the colliery that no wagons would come through. Well, there wouldn't be any wagons, would there? Because the mine wasn't working. So there was no reason to suppose that wagons would come through the tunnel. And they set off. Now, you'll need your imaginations here. I don't know if they just used candles or possibly minor safety lamps, but they were walking through the tunnel. They'd got a good mile in the tunnel, checking and writing down any problems that would need to be uh, sorted out and repaired. When first of all, they must have felt a vibration in the soles of their feet.
feet. And then they heard the most ghastly rumbling coming ever nearer out of the blackness. And finally, they probably saw the guttering flame of a candle or a safety lamp coming towards them. Go up to the colliery, please. Here, two young lads, a Peter Downey and a Thomas Natras, are loading one wagon, not with coal, but with rubbish and spoil. They were, of course, tidying up the area. And the idea was that when the wagon was loaded, about two, two and a half tons worth, they would push the wagon with all the rubbish through the tunnel and dump it into, or dump the rubbish into the River Tyne. The wagon is loaded, it's ready to go at the colliery. Peter jumps on the front of the wagon. There must have been a small platform for him to perch on. He will be the lookout to see that there are no obstacles, a plank of wood, a brick fallen on the lines as the wagon comes through the tunnel. Thomas, at the back of the wagon, pushes the wagon, runs to jump on the back. He will operate the brake to control the speed as the wagon comes through the tunnel. He runs, he slips in the mud, and the last thing he sees is the wagon disappearing into the black mouth of the tunnel at Spittle Tongues. You can see the mouth of the tunnel on your map. Two, three minutes go by. Peter, on the front of the wagon, begins to realise the awful truth. The wagon is going faster and faster. There is no attempt to control its speed. And thoughts of death must have come to young Peter that in five or ten minutes, the wagon will rush out of the tunnel He'll either be drowned or crushed to death under the weight of the wagon. Come back to our three friends, the Arcturus brothers and Mr. Colson walking up the tunnel. What awful thoughts must have gone through their heads as they felt and they heard and they saw this wagon out of control rushing down upon them. How did they react? Mr. Coulson panicked, he turned and he tried to outrun the wagon, now doing close on 30 miles an hour. The wagon caught him and mercifully killed him outright. One of the Arcus brothers pressed himself hard against the wall of the tunnel, but there wasn't enough room between wagon and tunnel. His limb was crushed, he never walked, he never worked again. Miraculously, he did survive. But the other brother, or the other Arcus brother, must have had nerves of steel. He didn't try to run away. He lay down facing the danger on the floor of the tunnel, and the axles of the wagon just skimmed over his head. He was able to get up. Running up the tunnel, he came across Thomas Natras running down, shouting, Oh my God, my God, I've killed my mate, Peter. Well, I can finish this first part of our little story on a bitter sweet note, I suppose. Peter didn't die. Can you guess what saved Peter's life? It was the corpse, the corse, corpse of William Coulson. When the wagon had hit William Coulson, the wagon had been derailed and immediately jammed in the narrow confines of the tunnel. Peter was thrown spinning off. He must have had awful cuts and bruises, but it was well enough to give evidence the very next day at the inquest, and as far as I know, live to be an old man. So if there is a mysterious presence or a ghost in the tunnel, well, I suppose it must be that of Mr. William Coulson. But it's now time to move on. We now come forward to the 1930s. 
And here's a picture of a civil engineer carrying out a survey of the tunnel, probably in about 1936, when it was becoming more and more obvious that Great Britain once again needed to prepare for war and to think about how she would shelter her civilian population. And all county councils were instructed to start making provision to provide air raid shelters and other forms of protection for people. Newcastle seemed to have made a quite a slow start in this matter. Maybe they were too busy congratulating themselves because here in the Victoria Tunnel, they had a more or less ready made two and a quarter mile long air raid shelter already. Rather dirty, about six inches of Victorian coal dust on the walls and two or three feet of spoil on the floor, but with a certain amount, in fact a considerable amount of money, it could be cleaned up and converted into some sort of possible air raid shelter, though not exactly luxurious by any stroke of the imagination. <clears throat> Well, they spent a lot of time congratulating themselves and talking about it because it was late in 1939 after the outbreak of the war before the final go ahead was given for the conversion, the cleaning up of the Victoria Tunnel. And I'm sure the local citizens were very glad of it within a short while of war breaking out. They certainly needed to spend long periods of time down in the Victoria Tunnel, at least in the early years of the war. The reason for that is not that Tyneside was heavily bombed during the war compared to Liverpool or Liverpool, uh, London or Coventry, for example. There were, I think, about 52 air raids on Newcastle. And of course, there were fatalities, but relatively few. The reason why people would spend long hours down in the tunnel, however, is this. The Luftwaffe flying across the North Sea from Holland, usually, or Denmark, would use the River Tyne as a navigational aid, a silvery thread in the night leading to the west, towards the convoy ports of Belfast and Glasgow and Liverpool and Manchester areas. They would come across, not of course altogether, but in wave after wave, the sirens would sound, the local Geordies would hurry down the shelter, praying that the bombs were not for them. And usually that turned out to be the case. But the bombers have now disappeared to the west and it would be several hours, perhaps as many as five or six, before the final wave of bombers would return on the same route, flying over Tyneside on the way eastwards out over the North Sea. If they still had any bombs on board, they would jettison the bombs. It's not a good idea, apparently, to land a bomber with fused bombs on board. They would jettison their bombs over built up areas, not over areas of any particular strategic importance, but just really to get rid of the bombs. That is why it wasn't really safe for the locals to leave the shelters until the final all clear was given. Newcastle, as I said, escaped relatively lightly, but there is one or really four tragedies I must tell you about before moving on. This is a tragedy that occurred in Torset Street, which is very near the entrance that we'll see later where we take you into the tunnel. <clears throat> And on the night of the 5th or the 6th of May 1941, there was a heavy air raid on Newcastle. And one bomb did fall on Tarset Street, just above the tunnel, penetrated the ground before exploding and made an underground uh, crater, if you like, uh, below people's feet. Another bomb exploded very close by and demolished the gable end of a house. 
the bricks of which fell on top of the hole that the first bomb had made when it had penetrated the earth. The bricks disguised the hole and it wasn't apparent that there was a hole under the bricks. The ground looked reasonably solid and the council in their wisdom had not cordoned off the area of bomb damage. <clears throat> When one morning, several days later, and after a spell of heavy rain, a little girl called Irene Page, only seven years old, came out to take a message to play. She ran across the bricks, which gave way, and she fell into the bomb crater. Quite a number of housewives must have seen her disappear, and they gathered around. The little boy, a near neighbour no doubt, called Ernie Smith, 12 years old, turns up. He must have had a lot of courage, little Ernie, because he said, tie some of your clothes lines together and lower me down into the bomb crater and I'll rescue Irene. He's lowered down and within a few minutes, no sound comes out from the crater. Two little bends down in the crater no sound coming forth. Quite a crowd will have gathered, by which time two off-duty firefighters, one of whom happens to be Irene's uncle, come along. They get a ladder, they go down into the hole, the crater, and within a few minutes, you've guessed it, there is no sound. Well, the four of them, the two kiddies, the two adults, they've not just gone to sleep, nor have they merely fainted, they had met with their deaths. When the bomb had exploded, it had released carbon monoxide gas. Because the bricks had obscured the entrance to the hole, a bit like a cork in a bottle, the gas could no longer escape. And the four of them were overcome and would die, no doubt, very quickly in the carbon monoxide atmosphere. So we stop at this point, uh, perhaps 150 yards into the tunnel below Tarset Street to point out uh, just above visitors' heads, a true tragedy did occur in May 1941. And there appears to have been some repair work done to the roof, perhaps because of bomb damage, or it may have been that there was to have been another entrance built in there, but they ran out of money. And I'll tell you why in a moment as we move to our next slide. And here it is. You can see the root of the tunnel with the actual shelters. You may need to look fairly carefully at the map here. If we start on the right hand side with number one, that's the entrance on O Street where we take people in. And we walk up to entrance number two, the emergency entrance at Craw Hall Road. That's the section. We can't go beyond that section. That's the section, of course, we take visitors into. Then if we move up towards the left of the map, uh, shelter number three is in Shieldfield Green, and then four, five and six are in a cluster around Barris Bridge, because at that time it was uh, quite densely populated, that area of the city. And finally, you can see if you walk, if you go up Claremont Road, number seven, the seventh entrance. Originally, there were going to be something like 17 entrances, but money ran out, spent, I think, £37,000 altogether after that, which they couldn't afford any more entrances. And one of the main culprits in this for why they couldn't build any more entrances is number two at Craw Hall Road, because just about everything possible went wrong when they were building this or cutting this entrance, which they cut from inside out, by the way. Well, what didn't they cut through? <laughs> they cut through the gas line, the electric cables, the telephone cables, and worst of all, they cut it into an underground spring, releasing the water, which runs to this day down through the, the tunnel, in fact. They thought originally it was just a pocket of saturated sand, and they brought in a crane with a steel grab to empty the water out. And they poured, I suppose, millions of gallons of water down Crawhall Road towards the Ooseburn. 
undermining the foundations of some houses. They had to stop. The damage was considerable. The insurance claims put a stop to any other further ideas for more entrances than the seven that we can see on the map. And here's actually a photograph of one of the entrances being cut. Almost certainly, I think this is number seven, the entrance, uh, the entrance by Claremont Road. And apparently, it was quite difficult originally to find the route of the tunnel before they were able to begin work. Though, as I say, the tunnels were cut, or the entrances, sorry, were cut from inside the tunnel outwards. And I've got two photographs here to show you, one after the other. This is the entrance at uh, or next to St. Thomas's Church. And it was to be a super duper double entrance, meaning more people could get down as quickly as possible. And when you got in, it was quite steep. You needed to get down to a depth of at least 30 feet quickly before you were at all safe from bombs. So it was no good having a nice, gentle entrance. And so, by the way, the entrance that we take you in now, number one by the the uh, the time, uh, as an air raid shelter section, that was hopeless because you were far too near the surface. You needed there to get in and walk along quickly, quite a long way. But here you can see this is quite a steep drop into the uh, entrance. And here it is again, but obviously having been completed, um, I think on the right would be St. Thomas's Church. Straight ahead would now be the Civic Centre. But as you can see in those days, there are a lot of houses and also an eye hospital in the area. And you can see quite clearly it's a double entrance and you can see that it's very steep indeed going down. Now let's go back into our tunnel near the entrance down at Ouse Street. As you come into the tunnel, we take a sharp turn to the right, and I point out on the right-hand wall two yellow patches. These were uh, yellow paint put on as a rather macabre warning in case there had been a poison gas bomb. The yellow patches would apparently change to salmon pink, which would be a warning uh, perhaps to the poor people sheltering in there to get their gas masks on. But in fact, I think they'd probably be too late. More likely it was intended for rescue squads it would be a warning that there could still be poison gas lurking in the tunnel. Well, thank God, poison gas was not used in the Second World War, not at least in that manner. Just past the yellow patches, we come to a series of five blast walls. These are heavy concrete walls. And if you look at the first one here, you can see it's actually, it's really three walls. You've got a zigzag around. This, of course, is meant to reduce the power of a blast. If a bomb fell near here, you'd be dead. But even if you were a mile further up the tunnel, the blast creates a very powerful wave of high air pressure, which will suck the air out of your body and kill you. So there's a series of five of these blast walls, which reduces the power of the blast down. We've preserved in two sections, the now very fragile and very weak 1940s lighting. I think mentally it must have been quite depressing to spend hour after hour down in the tunnel, waiting, waiting for the all clear. There was lighting, as we say, and the tunnel was left open 24 hours a day, in fact. But I don't think you'd have been able to read or knit. You'd have been able to see people walk past. But it must have been a very dismal place to spend all those hours. Mentally, 
and physically for that matter rather uncomfortable as you'll see in a moment or two. You might also though notice from this slide that the bricks have been painted white and in uh, most of the sections of the tunnel, in fact it should have been in all of them, the walls have been painted with a lime wash. The lime wash helps to enhance the poor visual quality a little bit but it also was supposed to contain a disinfectant which reduces the chance of you catching other people's germs and cold. Whether it actually did or not, I'm not quite so convinced. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. There was a problem, however, in the tunnel, the problem of the disappearing light bulbs. And I don't think the council ever solved the problem of why people kept taking the light bulbs. It's not as if they were worth very much money. And it was many years later that we discovered what we think is the truth from a visitor who could remember coming into the tunnel as a teenager to do some of his courting. Uh, in those times, the houses or many of the houses in the area would be small and there wouldn't be very much privacy. So where could teenagers go to do their courting? Well, of course, the Victoria Tunnel, and it had some convenient bunks in there. Of course, you wouldn't come and do your courting during an air raid. But as I said, the tunnel was open 24 hours a day. And young couples would come down, take the light bulbs out to make the atmosphere a little bit more romantic. But you must have had a good imagination to think if this place is romantic and do their courting. But then when they came to put the light bulbs back, it was so dark they couldn't find the sockets. So they either just stuffed them into the side walls and there's still one in there or stuffed them into their pockets and made their way out. The council never got to the bottom of that mystery. Here we can see some of the replica uh, benches and bunk beds provided. <clears throat> Theoretically, the tunnel could accommodate up to 9,000 people. We never think more than about 7,000 would actually use the tunnel, but it must at times have been fairly crowded in there. There was seating for about 2,500 and bunk beds for about uh, 1,600 people. The bunk beds are at least in theory reserved the very top presumably just for children because there's not very much headroom. The middle bunks were reserved for pregnant ladies or nursing mothers and the bottom bunks were reserved for off-duty firefighters or policemen. At least that was the theory but in actual fact we think the biker mafia or the biker grannies really organised who got the bunks and who didn't. During bad periods, apparently, the local grandmothers would regularly come down long before a bombing raid and grab a certain territory down there, which they would defend against all comers. So, although we like to think that most people would be unselfish and good neighbours, there were examples of mugging, theft and drunkenness and also of grabbing of certain areas of bunk beds and benches as well. I said earlier that physically and mentally it must have been quite hard to take to spend night after night down in the tunnel and the authorities were quite rightly concerned about people's health down here. They invited an inspector from the Ministry of Health in London to come and to the man's credit he did spend a night in the tunnel. His report however was not exactly full of compassion I don't think. He took the attitude that most of the local folk were of course of northern stock and they came from miners' families, therefore they were all used to damp and dark conditions, much more suited physically to these conditions than to the people who lived in the south of England. They could put up with these conditions much more easily. Well, I'm not at all persuaded really by that argument. Some people ask us if there were toilets. 
And some of the very old people we ask were there toilets in the tunnel actually say there weren't. I think they wanted to blot out the memory of them. There were, of course, toilets on the surface at the entrances, but during an actual air raid, of course, you couldn't leave the tunnel. I believe you could actually smoke in the tunnel, except during the actual air raid itself. Toilets were provided then in the tunnel itself. And here we've got a real toilet that was discovered in the tunnel. It's an Elsand toilet, chemical toilet. There would be six of these provided at the base of the steps under each entrance, six of them for men and six of them for women on the other side of a wall. Of course, you could protect your modesty because there was a canvas screen so that while you were relieving yourself, people were walking past, but they couldn't exactly see what you were doing. Yes, there were wardens who patrolled the tunnel and here's Mr. Weddell with his good wife. What a great job being a tunnel warden. No bombs are going to get you 50, 80 feet deep under Newcastle Street, are there? And of course, you could find neighbours, perhaps particularly neighbours you didn't, didn't like for, uh, for minor crimes that they might commit, getting drunk, relieving themselves where they shouldn't in the tunnel, smoking. You were fined apparently five pounds if you urinated in the tunnel, except in one of the toilets. But I don't know whether I'd really like Mr. Weddell's job, because one of his tasks was to empty those chemical toilets that we saw in the previous slide. He had to carry these up, up to an 85 feet uh, height, up the steps to the entrance, empty the buckets, clean them, and then bring them back down. I don't think it would be the pleasantest of jobs at all. And so here we are, coming up to modern times. And the morale of this part is, please don't mess around with beautiful old Victorian structures or you do damage. We see the first of two examples of that here. In 2004, construction began on Lime Square Flats, just above the tunnel. In order to provide stable foundations, piles were sunk into the earth. One of the piles has nudged, we think, a boulder against the side wall of the tunnel, slightly skewing the brick alignment of the tunnel. The group were down there in 2004 and the guide noticed a little bit of brick dust lying on the ground. This was inspected, the tunnel was immediately shut and it took I think three years before a sufficient amount of money running into millions of pounds was raised in order for this section to be reinforced by spraying two layers of ferro concrete on the walls of this 30, 40 yard section, which echoes as you walk through. Well, no sooner do you get through this section, than there's another section which has been damaged. It's where the old key side railway cuts across and above the Victoria Tunnel. The key side railway runs, obviously, from the key side in a tight horseshoe up over the tunnel towards well, where Manor's metro station is today. And in the 1930s, when the tunnel was being inspected and adapted, as you walked up, you would have seen the steel girders of the Quayside Railway cutting across the roof of the Victoria Tunnel. That section needed to be reinforced before you could allow thousands of people down to shelter. They could actually look through the brickwork of the tunnel between gaps where mortar had fallen out and see the railway lines and the electric locomotives using the old Quayside Railway. That part, just past what we see here, 
was also reinforced with a concrete arch. And when you tap on it, you hear how, how hollow it sounds because just above visitors' heads is the old quayside railway with the line still there. Well, that doesn't explain, however, why that section of the tunnel is damp. The quayside railway was closed in 1969 and rather foolishly, they simply blocked up the entrances so that rainwater, which previously had flowed out of the Quayside Railway, could no longer do so. It now flows out through the Victoria Tunnel. So as we walk through that section, we warn people not to touch the walls because there's a rust coming out from the old girders and railway lines. And if you get it on your clothes, it's virtually impossible to wash it out. And so here we are, finally, at the end of our little talk. This is the entrance that we take you in, number one in our previous map, the entrance down at Ouz uh, Street, where we uh, take, you, take you in. Nowadays, of course, we are very kind to people. We give you hard hats and torches. But in earlier tourist visits, semi-official visits, I think, back in the 1970s, there were certain warnings. You had to be of appropriate physique, not too heavy, not too large, because you then had to get down through a manhole to get into the tunnel. Here you just walk in on a level. You, ought to, you also had to bring your own overalls, and your own torch. So I think hard hats were provided, presumably in case you smashed your head against the brick roof and damaged some of the bricks. And you also had to be free of relevant phobias, meaning if you were worried about bats and mice and things like that, probably the tunnel wasn't for you uh, back then. Now it's much more civilised, of course. The tunnel is clean. It's inspected on a regular basis. You don't need an overall. You need sensible shoes, but we provide you with all the other equipment that you need. Hope to see you down there one of these days. Thank you very much. Goodbye.